When I was in Thailand this last time, I went to pay my respects to Ajahn Thai. When I got there, he was talking to a group of lay people, and he invited me to join the conversation and start asking questions about the monastery here. One of his questions was, when Westerners come to the monastery, what do they come for? I said, most people come looking for peace of mind. And one of the lay people commented, it sounds like those Westerners are going right for the top. He turned to them and said, what do you mean right for the top? Even common animals want peace of mind. If you're a human being, you want something better than that. You want goodness as well. In other words, if you're looking for a happiness, it puts your mind at rest. That has to be good, too. It has to be harmless. It has to be blameless. That, of course, is a value judgment, but it's an important one. As the Buddha said, the beginning of wisdom is, among other things, asking what is blameworthy and what is blameless, what is skillful, what is unskillful. What one I do will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. What one I do will lead to my long-term harm and pain. Disturbance starts with the realization that there are these dualities, these choices you have to make. That one course of action is better than another because it gives better results. And your discernment lies in seeing that which is the better. This is a theme that goes all the way through the practice. The fact that you're sitting here right now meditating, you've made the choice, this is better than going out and having a few drinks, even though there's pleasure that could be had that way, you realize that it causes a lot of harm to your health, to your safety, to the state of your mind. even more innocent sensual pleasures. The Buddha said it's better to get the mind in a state of concentration where you put sensuality aside, your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures, and find a pleasure that comes from simply inhabiting the body. Being here with the breath, noticing how the breath feels throughout the body, developing a sense of ease around the breath, and then allowing that ease to spread. Thinking of the breath as your first experience of the body, your primary experience of the body. So when the breath is easeful, you can let that ease spread anywhere in the body and give it priority. So that even though there may be pains in some parts of the body, the breath and the pleasant breath has a priority over that. When you can find a sense of well-being here, then the temptation to go out and do something unskillful gets a lot weaker. So this is a better pleasure, and it's harmless. You're not afflicting anybody. Remember the Buddha's first instruction to Rahula. When you are thinking about doing something, ask yourself, do you expect it will afflict anybody? And if you see that it either will afflict other people or afflict yourself or both, you don't do it. There's a better course of action. That's beginning discernment. The fact that you're sitting here meditating, it's a better course than action than a lot of other things you could be doing. But of course there are levels of concentration, levels of attainment, and some are better than others. This is why when you settle down with the breath, work the breath of the body, there will come a point when you begin to realize that analyzing the breath and trying to improve the breath doesn't make it any better than it is. In which case you decide, okay, the better course of action will be to settle down and just be with the breathing. Try to develop a sense of oneness with the breathing. That, too, is a better course of action. So it's always important that we realize that wisdom lies in seeing dualities, 
and getting a sense of which course of action is better than another. This is one of the best ways that people can teach you things, is they can show you two things and point out why one is better than the other. I have a photography book where the photographer would have two pictures of one site and a little discussion as to why one of the pictures was a better picture than the other. It learned a lot about photography that way. When you have something to compare, you see things you didn't see, you wouldn't have seen otherwise. If you just looked at one side, you could say, oh yes, the color here is warmer. There's more variety to the color. The, the composition is better. There's always something to notice when there are differences. So this is how you develop your own discernment. You get the mind into a state of concentration, and you get it into another state of concentration, and you can compare the two. Or when you come out of concentration and you see the mind going for something, you can ask yourself, well, which is better, the mind when it was concentrated or the mind when it's running around? And the fact that you have something to compare things with refines your sense of judgment. Because that's one of, the <clears throat> one of the aspects of discernment is developing sound judgment as to what's worth doing, what's not, what's better to do than one other thing. In one of the Buddhist descriptions of the factors for awakening, he points out that analysis of qualities is the discernment factor. And he defines it as seeing, dis making distinctions, seeing the difference between, as he says, bright states of mind and darkened states of mind skillful states and unskillful states. I remember reading a footnote given to a translator of that passage. He was perplexed. He said, this is supposed to be the discernment faculty, and yet it's, it talks about skillful and unskillful actions. I, was, I myself was surprised at the and yet, and yet, because that's what discernment is. The translator was probably assuming that discernment meant seeing things as inconstant, stressful, and not self. But that's one aspect of discernment. And then the aspect there, of course, is when is it useful to see things as constant, when is it useful to see them as inconstant? Because everything has both sides. When is it useful to stress the pleasant aspects of something, and when is it useful to stress the stressful aspects? When is it useful to stress the fact that you have some control over your actions? And when is it useful to focus on things being not-self? Because the whole purpose of these perceptions is to give you some guide, guidance in how to choose what to do. And your discernment lies in knowing exactly when to apply which perception. When you're focusing on your choices, that's not a time to say, well, my choices are not self, so I'll just go with whatever. That's a time to have an assumption that okay, you are responsible. And you have the desire to do something well, so go with that desire, whatever seems to be the better option. And if it turns out that it was a mistake, well, you've learned something you wouldn't have learned otherwise. And then you can use that knowledge the next time around. When you're practicing concentration and the breath is uncomfortable, that's not the time to say, well, everything is stressful, inconstant, not self. Just leave it there. The mind will have trouble settling down. So you do what you can to make the breath comfortable. Change the length, change the depth, the speed with which you breathe, the heaviness. There are lots of things you can work with. In fact, one of the best ways of developing your powers of evaluation is to try different ways of breathing to see what effect they have on the body, and then decide which is better. 
because this is something that no one else can give you precise instructions on, because no one else can sense your breath as you're feeling it right now. Your body, and then the body as you feel from the inside, that's your own territory, so you've got to explore it. What a teacher can do is simply point out that there will be these different ways of breathing and there are these different ways of experience in the body. Can you detect them? It's like learning to be a professional taster. By giving you a vocabulary and pointing out the differences between different, different scents, different tastes, you begin to see, oh yeah, there really is a difference which you wouldn't have noticed without the vocabulary. So this is why teachers are useful on the path. They give you the mental apparatus for noticing differences so that you can then decide, what should I do with these differences? What's the best thing to do with these differences, or what's the better thing to do? And keep on learning. Even as the mind gets into deeper and deeper states of oneness, you'll find that one state of oneness is better than another. And some are better for different purposes, so you refine your discernment that way as well. It is possible to get the mind into formless states, and they are much more refined and quiet than focusing on the body. But as John Lee points out, it's like having worked and then living off your pension. Whereas focusing on the body is working and getting a salary at the same time. As long as you're working, the salary doesn't want run out. If you live off your pension, you never know. You might run out. And even when you get to the ultimate state of oneness in the mind. The Buddha said that, too, is fabricated, just like all the other parts of the path. So there's something better to do there, which is to learn how to let go. Because underlying all of this is a realization that experience comes in two types, fabricated and unfabricated. The unfabricated is nirvana, and it's so much better than everything else that it is the goal. Everything else is done for the purpose of that. So given that there's this basic duality in the potentials for human experience, it only makes sense that discernment will be dual as well. This is why the Buddha's first teaching was the Four Noble Truths, right view then the desires that lead to suffering, and then the desires that, when they're implemented properly, can lead to the end of suffering. One course is better than the other. So have some appreciation for dualities. Have some appreciation for the fact that there is a way to judge things that is really useful. Learn how to be wise in your judgments, judicious rather than judgmental. Because practicing discernment this way really is better than not. <laughs>